Welcome everyone to The Greatest Adventure, Neil Armstrong and the Moonshot, featuring Dr. Douglas Brinkley. We're excited to have you at this event, part of the Purdue Institute for Civic Communication Forum Series. I'm Mason Arnoldi, a sophomore in aeronautical and astronautical engineering. I'm also a member of the Purdue Institute for Civic Communication, or PICC. And I'm Evia Bafano, a senior double majoring in political science and economics, and I'm a student assistant to the executive director of the PICC. This forum demonstrates the essential links between the humanities and engineering in great achievements. Going to the moon required more than science, as do solutions to most challenges facing our world. I haven't worked on projects as exciting as a moonshot yet, but I have worked on and mentored robotics teams. People like me on the engineering side thought we were the lifeblood of the team because without the robot, we wouldn't have been a robotics team. The humanities side, writers, artists, speakers, salespeople, thought they were the lifeblood because without the community support, there would be no team at all. Both, per both perspectives were right and they were wrong. Engineering and humanities are opposite sides of the same equation. Technology is most valuable when it integrates human needs and desires, understands the impact on society, employs effective communication, and recognizes the human efforts that made it possible. As a student in both the humanities and management schools, I've had similar experiences, where students from different disciplines view situations through their respective lenses. The PICC allows students like Mason and me to gain practical experiences, working for solutions on diverse teams. The PICC has given us innovative classes, leadership and networking opportunities, and forums like this one. It is our platform for making the most of communication skills we need to succeed. Personally, I cannot fully exp express the extent to which the close relationships I have built through this institute have helped me grow, both professionally and personally. Students are given access to industry leaders, top journalists and analysts, and other great communicators. And now the founder and executive director of the PICC, Ambassador Carolyn Curiel. Good evening, everyone. Uh, let's hear it again for Evian Mason. They are part of a crew of fabulous students who have put together events like these and they work very hard on the event tonight. Would the students working this event please stand? Let's hear it for them. You will notice a couple of the students here with handhelds. They are, uh, I'm sorry, with laptops. They are working on monitoring Twitter. You'll be able to ask questions tonight via Twitter at Purdue ICC and you'll be able to come up, up to the aisles and ask your questions live as well. Uh, the students on Twitter are Allison Geyer, Connor Shearer, Frank Speak, and Jonathan Goodwin. So how do you build a better student? How do you build a better experience for our students, a better educational experience? It's what PICC is about. We give students the tools and we tell them, tell them to do it themselves. And they do. We have them write their speeches and deliver them. We have them produce forums like this. They come on experiential learning classes. We take students to Washington DC for part of a Maymaster class at C-SPAN. We spend two weeks there. We send them for summer long internships in partnership with, with our friends at engineering. This year we'll have 10 engineers going to Washington DC, taking a class and working in a meaningful internship experience. That's real learning. It's real world application of what our students have learned in the classrooms here at Purdue. And it will help them have a leg up when they go out to use the degree that they worked so hard to achieve. So if you are not a member of PICC and you are an undergraduate student, we are university-wide and why haven't you come by? We want the doers from Purdue to be part of PICC. 
That means we will test your abilities. If you're not comfortable writing a press release, guess what I'm going to ask you to do? If you're not comfortable speaking, guess what I'm going to ask you to do? I'm going to ask you to come up with thoughtful questions for our guests, like Doug Brinkley tonight, and we will make sure that you have the best learning experiences ever, learning from the people at C-SPAN and in Washington, D.C. Last year, we went to the White House and met with members of the national security staff. We met with Speaker John Boehner. We met with both Indiana senators, and we met with top officials at State Department, at the New York Times, the Washington Post, and Bloomberg View, just to name a few of the things we did. So go to our website. It's uh, on your brochures that you, I hope, picked up on your way in. And give us, send us an email, give us a call. We would love to welcome you on board. And did I mention that we give out tens of thousands of dollars in scholarship money thanks to our generous donors, including the Daniels Fund, which has made the PICC possible. So next I would like to introduce to you the person who will be uh, introducing our president, the Dean of our College of Engineering, Leah Jamison. Thank you, Carolyn. And, and I will, before I say a few words about the connection between Neil Armstrong and Purdue, I, I'm going to echo what Carolyn said about this incredible partnership between PICC and engineering, um, articulated by Carolyn, articulated by um, the students in their introduction. Um, the partnership between the liberal arts, between communication and, and engineering, and more broadly STEM, is probably the most promising hope we have for um, changing the world. And so I am very grateful to be able to be a partner and to be a part of this this evening. And I'm simply going to say a few words about the connection between Neil Armstrong and Purdue. Um, uh, simplest description, Purdue's most famous alum, bar none. Um, certainly the iconic image of his first step on the moon um, has come to represent the dreams and aspirations of a nation and, over time, of the world. But for Purdue, I believe it's also much more personal. Um, images of and, remem and memories of Neil Armstrong presenting to Purdue President Hovde a flag that he carried with him on his Gemini 8 mission. Um, boot prints on our campus outside the Neil Armstrong Hall of Engineering for children to take their own giant leaps um, cast from the astronauts' boots that are preserved in the Smithsonian. Our own Purdue images that include Neil Armstrong waving the Purdue flag in ross Aid Stadium, um, beating the world's biggest drum, and literally thousands and thousands of students, faculty, staff, visitors own memorable images um, with the statue of Neil Armstrong as a student. And it's more personal, I find, as I travel um, around the world and meet people from Purdue, um, graduate student alums who talk about being a teaching assistant and having Neil in class and always noting that he was a really good student. Um, recently, a Purdue alumna who grew up in Ohio who met Neil Armstrong at a local outreach event. She was a high school student thinking about college and relating that he was the one who convinced her that she should not stay in state in Ohio, that in fact she should come to Purdue, study aeronautics and astronautics, and then stayed in touch with her throughout her college career and throughout her career at NASA. And my own personal experience of having him greet me with a huge smile and a hug, which is something I will never forget. Um, for many of us, part of that special connection absolutely includes Neil Armstrong's pride in being an engineer. He was someone who didn't demonstrate pride, rarely liked to talk about himself, but he absolutely liked to talk about engineering and giving credit to the 
army of engineers who made spaceflight and the missions possible. Um, he would note, for example, that some people see the glass as half empty and other people see the glass as half full. But an engineer always wonders why the glass is twice as big as it has to be. <laughs> At the dedication of Armstrong Hall, he talked about engineering and his personal definition of engineering, that engineering is about what can be. It is the single best definition of engineering that I have ever heard. And Neil Armstrong, more than anyone in memory, gave us an unforgettable image of what can be. The special place that, that Neil has in Purdue Hearts was never clearer than at the memorial service organized by students two days after his passing. Um, for as far as the eye could see at the corner of Stadium and Northwestern, people filling that corner surrounding Armstrong Hall um, to remember him. Um, students who were far too young to have watched the first step on the moon, um, faculty and staff, people from the community, all gathered to remember Neil Armstrong. And I would say in our own way, to say, you, know, you belong to the nation, you belong to the world, you belong to history, but in our hearts, you will always be a Boilermaker. And this connection lives on and is certainly one of the things that makes being um, from Purdue very, very special. So it's my honor now to introduce Purdue's Chief Boilermaker, President Mitch Daniels. Thanks, Leah. Welcome all. It's not a new uh, concern, it's not a new worry that Americans know far too little about their history and about our traditions. Uh, every year, someone takes a new depressing uh, survey of our fellow citizens. And uh, in 2012, one showed that only half could name the war in which the Battle of the Bulge occurred. Fewer than half knew who the American general was at Yorktown. Some thought it was Grant, some thought it was Robert E. Lee. This was a multiple choice test. Only uh, one in six knew that the phrase of the people, by the people, for the people, comes from the Declaration of Independence. That was a test, by the way. <laughs> Over half of them thought that, however. And uh, I might have said, it by way of preface, these are college graduates on whom I'm reporting. Now, a nation as ours is united not by ethnicity, not by tribe, not by religion, but solely, if united at all, by an idea and by an ideal. A nation that made history, in fact, defied history, the human history of domination by kings and tyrants and generals and authoritarians and created a nation by consent of the governed. If in that nation, pluribus is to be unum, then we better have great historians. More to the point, we better have great storytellers, uh, people who can reach out to broad sections, not merely to the scholastically inclined, but to an entire population of people who would be uh, free and self-governing, and uh, teach them their history and remind them of uh, their traditions, those things that ought to bring us together and ought to make us proud. Our speaker tonight has often, you know, typical Midwestern modesty, the same modesty we associate with Neil Armstrong, described himself as a storyteller. As you will know, or will have read already, he's a distinguished professor at Rice University. He's the author, if I don't miscount, of 36 books, although he's so prolific that that number must slip out of date on a regular basis. If I can just 
mention one personal uh, debt that I owe him. His book, Wilderness Warrior, a magnificent survey of uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt's life and, and career and commitment to conservation motivated me in a previous life uh, to work extra hard on that same cause and to get some things started in Indiana which have taken us uh, beyond, well beyond anywhere we were before. And I would date much of my, the intensity of my interest in that subject to that wonderful book that he brought us. Across, those, across that body of work, he has written about history shaping individuals from Theodore Roosevelt to Henry Ford to Dean Acheson to James Forrestal to so many more. History shaping events like World War II, the unification of Europe. History shaping phenomena, the Mississippi River, Hurricane Katrina. If America had or named an historian laureate, our guest tonight would certainly be our choice. Tonight, as Leah mentioned, he's here to talk about a subject of very special interest and pride and reverence to every Boilermaker, every friend of this university. It's a topic one might hope could become the subject of book number 37 or 38. But in any event, we're about to be treated to personal reflections about our most esteemed and favorite gift to the nation by another real gift to the nation. Please welcome Dr. Douglas Brinkling. Well, thank you very much. I, I want to say governor. I'm so used to saying governor and thinking of you, governor, not just president of Purdue University and not just a governor, but Governor Daniel, somebody I've admired for, for a long time. He's exactly what we need in American public life, somebody who looks at issues and grabs them by the scruff of the neck and comes up with new ideas. So it's truly an honor, governor, for you to introduce me. I also want to thank my friend um, Brian Lamb and his marvelous school of communication here. Brian is a man of just blinding integrity. And uh, anytime I'm in his presence, I always feel very honored and he's a very special to me. And this is my first time to Purdue. Uh, my wife, Ann, is here with me in the front row and uh, we're gonna be circulating around meeting students tomorrow and the rest. So I'm, I'm greatly looking forward to my time here. Now, um, I got involved with Neil Armstrong, I suppose, because I was a boy growing up in Ohio in a town called Perrysburg near Toledo, just down the road, not too far from Wapakoneta. And I'm now 53 years old, so I was I'd be born in 1960. So I was you know, nine years old at the time of Neil Armstrong's uh, going to the moon, and that was everything for me. Some people talk about looking, remembering the Vietnam War. I remember that, and I remember Watergate, but just what, what um, that meant when the hometown boy from Ohio and from Purdue University, is what I'm gonna talk about in a minute, um, went that far to the moon so, uh, and, and, and broke the shackles of Earth, really, for the first time. So imagine how excited I was uh, when I got a chance to interview Neil Armstrong but it happened at a very odd time in American history, um, just days after 9-11 happened. Uh, in September of 2001, uh, I was in New Orleans and we, NASA had asked me to do an oral history and we, I won't get into all the details tonight about that, but I was gonna get to do an oral history of Neil Armstrong, he turned 70 and said he'd do one for um, NASA, and they wanted some, um, somebody like myself who had some enthusiasm for the topic to come down to um, Johnson Space Center and, um, and go interview him in Houston. Well, all airports were canceled. Everything was shut, so I figured there goes my interview. I finally get the reluctant hero. That's Neil Armstrong's nickname, the reluctant hero. Even his family calls him a reluctant hero. And he doesn't like talking to the press. And now at 9-11, this is, this is a washout. Well, no, he said, I don't cancel things. And he flew his way, his own way, from Cincinnati to Houston. And it was all an old-fashioned lesson in carry-on. 
And I have to pre-warn you here, uh, there are many great engineers and aeronautical engineers in particular in the audience um, or associated with Purdue University. I'm not that. And in fact, um, I almost embarrassed myself when I first started talking and interviewing Mr. Armstrong, because at one point I, I remember, and it's in the transcript to prove it, I did a real humanities question. I said, you know, Mr. Armstrong, do you ever just get out there and stand and look up at the moon and say, my gosh, you know, I, I, I was there? No, I don't. <laughs> that, was, that was it. And it wasn't that he didn't like me or wasn't giving me a hard time. He just didn't process like that. And um, in fact, not only is he a boilermaker, but he was most proud of being an engineer. And he thought engineers got short shrift in American history. And one of the quotes that he said that I like a great deal is, he said, I, I am never, I am and ever will be a white socks pocket protector nerdy engineer and I take substantial pride in the accomplishments of my profession. Science is about what is. Engineering is about what can be. So my lecture today is about what can be when an engineer puts his mind to something. And I, you all know, or any of the people here that knew Neil Armstrong slightly knows, he would not, he, you know, he always felt that it was, uh, you know, 400,000 people that got us to the moon. And he never really liked that idea of this celebrity hero, particularly. And so uh, the thought of even having a lecture on his, on his life and his biography, um, he'd, be, he'd be a little allergic to the concept. He has a great authorized biographer, James Hansen, who did a book in 2005. I recommend it all to you. I was lucky enough to review it for the New York Times. Uh, when it came out, and it's terrific, and it has some of the more detailed information uh, about his life. If my, if my talk tonight spurs you on to read one book, that's the one I recommend. Now, I mentioned Neil Armstrong's um, flying down to Houston for this oral history interview. It reminded me, in, in some ways, I had done my homework uh, at that time, you know, in getting prepared to interview him. When in 1947, when he was only 16 years old, he left the town of Wapakoneta to come here to West Lafayette. And most kids would have their parents take them if they were gonna come here. He was coming to just do his paperwork to enroll. But Neil Armstrong at age 16 flew here from Ohio, a couple hundred miles, uh, landed here, filled out his papers, and, and, and went back to Wapakoneta. And I always thought it's just, I mean, how many kids at that age can do that? And particularly in the 1947, um, that was already so accomplished at flight. He had gotten his pilot's license before he got a driver's license. Now, he was born August 5th, 1930 in Wapakoneta. Stephen Armstrong, his father, for the most part, worked for the state of Ohio as a auditor. Uh, this meant that he had to move around constantly. His father was very stern. Um, you know, his, the, the famous saying was straighten up to his children. Um, loving father, um, but, but tough. And his mother, Viola, um, Viola Louise Engel, before she became Viola um, Armstrong, she was a very devout Christian woman and always talked about God's faith and, and, uh, and you know, her belief in the Bible. And so, you know, those were, the, as any child, those were the two seminal influences on him. And um, when I said that they moved around a lot, Wapakoneta gets the credit for Neil Armstrong, birthplace, and of course today the museum is there. There's a Neil Armstrong Museum, and I recommend you go. But I just wanted to name to you some of the moves, 16 moves in 14 years. And here's a list of his Ohio Odyssey towns. Lisbon, 1930, Warren, 1930, Ravenna, 1931, Shaker Heights, 1932, Cleveland Avenue, uh, Cleveland Heights, 1932, Warren, 1933, Jefferson, 1934, Warren, 1936, Moulton, 1937, St. Mary, 1938, Upper Sandusky, 1941, Wapakoneta, 1944, where he graduated from high school. 
all within the state of Ohio, the state that likes to boast first in aviation. And um, his, his love of, of being a pilot was not that unusual for that era. I mean, here at Purdue, where I'm gonna mention in a second, I mean, I don't know if some people realize, I don't see him in a lot of the literature produced here, but a man named Cliff Turpin in 1908, um, a, um, somebody who was from Purdue, helped the Wright brothers redesign their engine and their controls that early from Purdue University in aviation. And the Wright brothers were, of course, great heroes to any kid growing up in Ohio because of their famous bicycle shop near Dayton in Ohio. Today does, you know, celebrates aviation as much as, as you do here at Purdue. Um, six years old, Neil Armstrong goes on his first flight. He goes up in a Ford tri-motor, the Tin Goose. It obviously had a big impression on him, or at least it's one of the ones he was willing to talk about as an adult. And um, he, he, at that point on, seemed to be very uh, quite hooked about it. There's a story about his love of aviation that Armstrong's never refuted. And believe me, he refutes a lot of stories said about him. I feel very bad for him. He had a lot of people say just wrong things, and he'd always try to correct the record, and these errors would creep back in. And I, I think probably nothing drove him crazier than that. But he had once talked about a reoccurring dream he had. This is the dream of Neil Armstrong. And he said, I could, by holding my breath, hover over the ground. Nothing much happened. I neither, I ne neither flew nor fell in those dreams. I just hovered. But the indecisiveness was a little frustrating. I just hovered. If you know anything about Neil Armstrong, he never talked about anything that might be considered vaguely occult or mystical. And certainly we all have dreams, but this notion of hovering and floating, and when you think about later with that, what happens when you're in space, uh, you can see why that dream circulated. Uh, the, the novelist Norman Mailer on his novel On Fire in the Moon, which is sort of nonfiction, you know, new journalism, they used to call it, tries to milk the dream for a lot of insights. But Armstrong always asked people not to think much about that. People had dreams that didn't add up to much. Just like when he was a boy, he climbed a tree, and uh, as all boys like to do in the Midwest, and he fell 15 feet and hurt himself terribly. He was trying to man up and not be in pain. And finally, you know, they, they, he said, go get mom because uh, he, he was in such excruciating pain. But when people asked him, you know, did you have a, a, something about getting high? You know, you needed to be in the branches. He said, the only thing I learned from that is never trust a tree branch. <laughs> um, and it was a typical answer of his. He never wanted to read too much into things. Um, by all accounts, when, it, when 1969 happened at the time of Apollo 11 and journalists went all around Wapakoneta and some of these other towns collecting stories of everybody said they knew Neil Armstrong and had their uh, Neil Armstrong story. I got to be the biographer of Rosa Parks and I believe there were like 13 people on the bus on December 1, 1955, the day of her arrest. About 13 were on the bus that day while I interviewed 37 of them. In, uh, in Montgomery, Alabama, when I was writing on her, everybody was on the bus, and now everybody in that part of Ohio uh, had a Neil Armstrong story suddenly. And so, one, you know, one had to, and still has to, kind of sift through it all. What is true is that he absolutely loved model airplanes, built them, built them so they could work, built them so they could fly, and undeniably, beyond parental influence or, and, 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 or influence perhaps of his siblings, um, the big deal was the Boy Scouts of America. He was a Boy Scout all of his life. And the Scouts are often talked about in, you know, presidents and the Scouts. Theodore Roosevelt was the big champion of the Boy Scouts um, when it got founded in, in FDR. Um, big champion of the Boy Scouts. I don't know if you realize, but FDR contracted polio in 1921 from swimming at Bear Mountain State Park, about 90 miles north of New York City, 
on the western bank of the Hudson was swimming with kids who had the polio virus and a few days later FDR contracted um, the, or got the polio then and it, it manifested itself at Campobello, New Brunswick, his summer home. Uh, they called it a cottage, but it was 36 rooms. And he could not feel his lower half anymore, FDR. But yet he constantly talked about the Boy Scouts are the greatest thing in America, so much so that right after March of 1933, when FDR said we have nothing to fear but fear itself, and created the Civilian Conservation Corps, 250,000 young um, men planting trees and fixing state parks and building ir irrigation ditches, on and on. Um, he, the idea, FDR said, came from the Boy Scouts for his administration. But what not often is talked about is that of the, I just want to read you the statistic, of the 294 individuals selected as astronauts between 1959 and 2003, out of 294, 200 of them were, were Boy Scouts. Four out of every five astronauts were Boy Scouts and stayed active in scouting, many of them making it to the Eagle Scout level. And of the 12 men who walked on the moon, 11 were Boy Scouts. This is so important that when Neil Armstrong, who was you, we I think already established tonight, wasn't a man who like took things that lightly, uh, was a professional at whatever he did. He was not glib in the least bit, but he did one very daring thing when he was went up in Apollo 11 in 1969 while flying towards the moon. Inside the Columbia, Armstrong said, "Quote: I'd like to say hello to my fellow scouts." and um, scoutmasters at Farrington State Park in Idaho who are having their national jamboree. And I'd like to um, send them all my best wishes. One of the few times that that was a very crisis moment when they're heading to the moon. And here he is thanking the scouts that were meeting at their jamboree at a state park in Idaho, getting a call out that the whole world heard at that moment. That was his thank you to what scouting meant to him. Now, the people have, you know, when you do oral history interviews and you talk to people at New Neil Armstrong, you can, one of the things a historian can do is start finding things that are similar. And whether you talk to engineers or people here at Purdue or test pilots or astronauts or hometown folks or family members or space program officials, um, everybody agreed with what Eugene Krantz said, head NASA flight director for NASA missions said, I never saw Neil get angry. He had the commander mentality and just never got angry. Be very hard to find in any circumstance where people saw him angry. He could forget something, he could make a mistake, but that seemed to be an emotion. He refused to let, let um, out. He bottled that up. He was too self-willed to allow himself to show anger. Now, when um, he's leaving Ohio to come here to Purdue um, and to go to college, um, you guys should be very proud of Boilermakers here. I mean, he got accepted into MIT and he told MIT, no, I'm going to Purdue instead. Uh, why he chose Purdue was because of the great program already existing here, but also he didn't feel that you had to go that far away to get a good education. Um, and as you all know, he was um, in love with Ohio and Purdue. In fact, after he walked on the moon, he moved back to Cincinnati, Ohio, the outskirts. And Michael Collins, the third of the Apollo astronauts, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins didn't go on the moon, but was there obviously um, in the Columbia and a uh, great astronaut. He, when Armstrong quit NASA to move back to Ohio, Collins took a swipe at him and he said, you, and he, he said that Neil Armstrong was locking himself in a castle and pulling up a drawbridge by going back to the Midwest and kind of abandoning the fame of, of being in Washington or New York. And Armstrong usually didn't fire back fiery darts 
In this case, he said back about Collins, who was living in Washington at that time, you know, those of us who live out in the hinterlands think the people that live inside the Beltway are the ones that have a problem. Um, he wanted to get back here to his roots. And what he decided when, when he came to Purdue, why aviation meant everything, I wanted you read a, 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 I wanted to read a line that he said that I liked a lot. And he said, by the time I was old enough and became a pilot, things had changed. The great airplanes I had so revered as a boy were disappearing. I had grown admiring what I perceived to be the chivalry of the World War I pilots, Frank Luke, Eddie Rickenbacker, Manfred von Richtenfeld, I always mess his name up, sorry, and Billy Bishop. But by World War II, aerial chivalry seemed to have evaporated. Air warfare was becoming very impersonal. The record-setting flights, John Alcock and A.W. Brown, Harold Gaddy, Charles Lindbergh, Amelia Earhart, and Jimmy Mattern across the oceans over the poles into the corners of the earth had all been accomplished. And I resented that. All in all, for someone who was immersed and fascinated and dedicated to flight, I was disappointed by the wrinkle in history that brought me along one generation late. I had missed all the great times and adventures in flight. Um, so he came here, um, you know, not knowing where this field was going to go, but comes to Purdue, and he came here because of a Holloway plan. Uh, Governor Daniels mentioned I wrote a biography on James Forrestal, Secretary of the Navy in World War II and first Secretary of Defense called Driven Patriot. Forrestal had helped push something called the Holloway Plan, uh, which was after World War II, this need for a new crop of naval officers um, and to establish things like the postgraduate school for the uh, Navy officers in Monterey, California and the like. And that scholarship allowed Neil Armstrong to come here at, at Purdue. Now, when we talk about coming to Purdue in the in 1940s after World War II, I want you all to keep this in mind. In that era, less than one in four, one in four Americans received a high school degree. And fewer than one in 20 ever went to college. That let alone graduate, just ever went ever enrolled in it. So it was just a big deal to go to college and go to a school as fine as Purdue for him. Purdue's interest, and I, I, I'm embarrassed to almost even talk about it with some of the people in the audience here, but Purdue produced 23 astronauts. Um, and the, um, it, it's a 30%, 35%, for example, in recent years of all the space shuttle astronauts have gone to Purdue. Um, the first man on the moon, Neil Armstrong, was in Purdue, and uh, Eugene uh, Cernan was um, the last man on the moon, was also from Purdue University. And um, when he started here at the Nautical Engineering Program, it was, uh, he was here from September 1947 to January 1955. That included a three-year stint in the military. Um, he had about a 7.5 year stretch here, seven and a half years of um, w where one way or another he was involved here, which was, it became a very amazing era and aeronautical development. It was different than those pilots that I read off that Armstrong wanted to be like. You had things going on while he was here at Purdue, like um, Dr. Von Braun out there in White Sands, New Mexico, launching in, in in making operable the V-2 missile. Um, you had uh, so much new technology coming in on aircraft carriers. Um, you know, we and keep in mind, you know, the Air Force, Department of Air Force of today was a part of a Truman administration. Stuart Symington, our first secretary of Air Force and all of that. But Navy aviation became very large because of the aircraft carriers. And this is what Neil Armstrong was. It's always important to remember that he was a naval aviator and something um, where many people will think he would have been in the Air Force. And, you know, so he had a great time here in a fraternity at a frat house on State Street, Phi Delta Theta, 
um, you know, met his future wife here at Purdue. I don't want to go gloss over it, but for the sake of time, his real education and difference of Purdue was being part of the Korean War. Um, he ended up getting his jet pilot wings when he was called to active duty in Pensacola Naval Air Station in Florida. Um, this is a period now when these, the Cold War's really heated up. Tr President Truman had signed a 5,000 mile guided missile tench, um, test range area um, to be established at, at Cape Canaveral. And he is the engineer pilot, uh, so young, you would have looked at him, you'd almost want to ask him for his ID. Um, and here he is um, as a, the first American, um, you know, uh, I mean, the first American on the moon, the first person on the moon is getting his first um, times really flying in an extraordinary ways during the Korean War. Um, from 1950 to 1953, he went on 78 combat missions during the Korean War. Um, that's just a number, you know, 78. But uh, in the museum business, sometimes you study one combat mission could tell you more about the others. Um, that's about 121 hours um, in the middle of the Korean War doing very high risk combat missions. The most famous one in September 3rd, 1951, when he has to e eject himself from a Panther because he had run through anti-aircraft cable and it knocked off about six to eight feet of his right wing. He was flying so low in Korea and he hit a cable, had to eject himself. Um, he would later say that it, in, in my interview with him, he said, if you're going that fast, the cable will make a very good knife. It just cut the uh, wing. And um, part of all of this period in the war of, with this kind of you know, heroics flying low at 350 miles an hour and, uh, and, and you know, taking the fight to North Korea, um, he uh, in landing jets on aircraft carrier, particularly the USS Essex, uh, but also involved with the USS Cabot and the USS Wright. Um, the great writer James Minchner was there for part of it in, uh, and he wrote a book uh, about his time there in Korea. Michener was kind of fictionalizing the guys on the Essex. Uh, and we think Neil Armstrong was one of the ones in the Minchner novel. I asked Neil Armstrong about James Minchner and about um, Minchner's time there in Korea. And here's what Armstrong said about Minchner. I thought he, incidentally, Armstrong was not gonna like the novel. I don't know, a lot of um, people in the military um, always don't like when somebody fictionalizes war. But he was a good reporter, Minchner, and here's what Armstrong said about him. He said, I thought it was an excellent representation of the kinds of flying that we were doing there. It was identical, same kind of aircraft and the same class carrier. They put girls in the movie of the, from the book, which I didn't remember from my experience. But actually, Minchner was on our ship, and I think he went for like three tours, or maybe two or three, you know, or four or five weeks at a crack, and he would just sit around the wardroom in the evening, or in the ready room in the daytime, and listen to us guys tell the actual stories. He didn't ask questions much of anything, he just kind of absorbed it all. So most of the things that happened in the book, which was quite a different book from any other book he's written in many ways, were actual events. Maybe he strung them together with different characters so they didn't happen precisely the way it would have been described in his novel, but nevertheless, they were basically all adaptations of true stories he was told. And so you want to understand that if you read Minchner on the Korean War and his fictionalization, you get to understand why uh, Neil Armstrong won the Air Medal or the Gold Star or the K Korean Service Medal, why he came out of the war so incredibly decorated. Um, now, keep in mind with Korea how excited the, everybody was in America when the war finally ended. You know, Harry Truman, they used to say, a saying was to air is Truman. He was so unpopular. I mean, we don't do wars of choice and Korea may have been one very well if we don't win them quickly and Korea was dragging on. Eisenhower runs for president in 1952, basically saying, I will get us out of Korea, I'm gonna visit. Uh, his exact quote was, I'll go to Korea. This is sort of the Eisenhower plan to get out of Korea and Ike wins in 53 and sure enough, six months later, 
we go get out of the Korean War, it's over. Neil Armstrong had that intense experience. He had his own band of brothers um, with fellow naval aviators. He comes back to Purdue um, and ends up, um, you know, trying to um, decide exactly what he's going to do in his life. By 1957, he gets to fly in his first rocket plane, a Bell X-1B at Edwards Air Force Base. There are many great stories about what it's like in Edwards there in the desert. I asked Mr. Armstrong about the movie, The Right Stuff, um, and, and, and actually the book by Tom Wolfe, which he, he wasn't as keen on as, um, as he was about the way Minchner wrote. But um, he, I talked to him also about Jaeger, and they went on a crazy flight together, Jaeger and Neil Armstrong, uh, actually two of them, where Armstrong tried to uh, land on, a, on a, an area that was difficult to, and the plane got kind of stuck in, the, in a dried up lake, and, um, and Jaeger kind of lorded it over Armstrong a little bit, but they were very different type of men, Chuck Yeager and Neil Armstrong. And where Neil Armstrong it was um, so, uh, had such composure and such a work go ahead ethic. Um, he was more of a, a, um, a flight boy, more of a stick and rudder man, Yeager, more like Buzz Aldrin, um, Chuck Yeager, um, not afraid of um, braggadocio or whatever, um, where Neil Armstrong was, was chronically afraid to ever be seen as if he were, were bragging. At that period, here he is now out in Edwards Air Force Base, and by 1957 is the big moment we have Sputnik. History changes that day. The Soviets have, um, the Soviet Union launches Sputnik 1, the world's first artificial satellite. The thing that always amazed me, we all hear about Sputnik in 57, you know Sputnik was the size of a beach ball. It weighed only 183.9 pounds, but the whole world heard about Sputnik. And um, it only took about 98 minutes, Sputnik, to orbit Earth on its elliptical path. And that launch obviously ushers in a new political, military, technological, and scientific age. Once Sputnik um, was launched, even though it may have been seen as a one-off event, the United States did not see it as that. And this whole space race begins. Eisenhower um, creates NASA, and space now becomes a big deal. Can we play, I have a little, we're gonna try the audio here. Let's play a little bit. It's a little fuzzy of Neil Armstrong talking about where he was when he heard about Sputnik. Sputnik in the whole did you recall where you were or anything about that? Yeah. The Society of Experimental Test Pilots was holding a symposium in the Beverly Hilton Hotel in October of 57. And uh, and I was working on, I, I think I may have been program chairman. But in it, I'm not sure about that now, but uh, for the symposium. But in any case, I was very much involved in the symposium that we were trying to find ways to get the uh, the uh, Los Angeles press interested in the kinds of technical presentations that were being uh, being produced there and and get a little coverage of, of what our industry was doing and what test what was happening in the test flight world but that was a very hard sell and it became completely impossible once Putnik uh, came across the sky and all of a sudden that we couldn't get any any people to come listen to problems about airplane flying. Um, the, the, I had written a, about Walter Cronkite at CBS, you know, he was a nothing kind of a utility guy at CBS by, by and large, but he was a, a aviator in World War II and by Sputnik, he was considered a military, I mean, he was a, a military reporter for aviation, Walter Cronkite. So CBS decides once NASA's creating Cape Canaveral's going that they're gonna start covering rockets that are either gonna fail or not fail, but it, it was cheap. It's just a camera on a site. And, and Cronkite really rides to fame on, uh, on the space coverage. You remember TV's just coming into play right now. And um, John F. Kennedy becomes the great television president. If FDR was the master of radio and maybe Ronald Reagan's the master of, 
of speeches. Kennedy was the master of the press conference, and CBS just started covering everything Kennedy. And Kennedy, to his credit, um, grabs a hold of, of space because television's interested in it too. And you get most famously John Glenn's um, ex uh, extraordinary feat, another fellow Ohioan on February 20th, 1962, when Glenn becomes the first American to orbit the Earth. It's an, a, back, a, a back at you moment. Um, to, the, to the Soviets. We, of course, had Alan Shepard, who was a hero of the Kennedy years. And as a Atlas launch vehicle propelled the, the uh, Mercury spacecraft into Earth orbit, it allowed Gre Glenn um, to circle Earth three times. The flight lasted for about four hours and 55 minutes, a little longer than that, but not much. But all the time seemed to stand still because everybody watched on television. If you didn't have one, you would tune in. A man, Don Hewitt, who went on to create 60 Minutes, built a huge screen in Grand Central Station that people will see John Glenn. And you remember, Glenn like disappeared for a little while. Nobody knew whether he was dead or alive or not, February 62. Cronkite was covering it all. And of course, um, he, he of course comes down and becomes the great. Um, the, the, it splashes down the ocean, Glenn's a great hero. And a group of media people rushed to John Glenn's mother and said, oh my gosh, are you now going to reunite with your son and you must be so excited to see him. And Mrs. Um, Mrs. Glenn said, oh well, yes, but I'm really excited to meet Walter Cronkite. <laughs> um, Cronkite had become a star. It was like Glenn and Cronkite. In fact, Cronkite got so big that nightly news went from 15 minutes. Cronkite got the anchor ship two months later in 62. And then it went, started going from 15 minutes to 30 minutes. And CBS, it just, and all of them, but they started just going space mad. Our country really is in on it. And Armstrong is still now part of, um, of this, what I called in my title of my talk, The Greatest Adventure. And the greatest adventure after Glenn is when John F. Kennedy goes to Congress, but also to my university, Rice University, and says at Rice um, that, he says at Rice University that um, we are gonna put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. And of course, he does, we do. And uh, Kennedy gets high marks in history for achieving that even though he was killed. Um, these, the Gemini programs kick in. They were gonna be called to, after the Mercury astronauts, the new nine. You had all sorts of, as some of you will remember, um, you know, the intense training and the way the media started covering it all. You also had a, a number of disasters, uh, most famously and most sadly, the Apollo 1 blowing up on March 16, 1966, killing Gus Grissom, a Purdue alum, um, and, um, and killing um, Ed White, and killing Roger Chafee, another Purdue alum, a horrible, dark day. What, what was touched me, and actually, the one time in my interview with Mr. Armstrong, I got goosebumps, is this voice, and he said, the thing is, we, they died on the ground, in the way he said that. That they didn't, they guys, these guys didn't mind if they died. They're putting their life on the line, but to die on the ground was the worst thing for, the, for, for them. And um, it, I still get chills when I think about this section in my interview that's too long to play tonight um, when, when we conversed about that. Um, well, the, the, he gets more and more noticed, Neil Armstrong, because of his cool headedness, his grace under pressure. Um, the fact that um, you know he's um, he's he was able to do in a uh, simulations uh, eject himself properly, knew how to land by the parachute, had, had almost like a built-in human compass, um, and just was by any all reports as calm on on all of as as things can be. Um, he gets picked largely because he now has quit. He's not in the Navy, and he is a civilian this era of the Vietnam War is going on, um, you know, uh, and here it is now, 67, 68, after the Tet Offensive in 68, Johnson gets his administration destroyed by Vietnam. By 1969, 
uh, when we're starting to swing into that big moment when the man goes to the moon. Uh, Nixon certainly wanted to have a civilian in space, um, not to militarize it. There are also debates on what to plant on the moon. Some people wanted a UN flag. You know, to, in, in, uh, Armstrong did not make the decision for that flag. And incidentally, it got, I once interviewed um, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, and Hugo Chavez, who said, Neil Armstrong never went to the moon. How can that flag of be waving like that? You know, he was a real nut, Hugo Chavez. I mean, uh, <laughs> but he was, um, you know, they got wrinkled up and then it, they had it there, you know, so it wasn't blowing. It almost looks like it's blowing, but it's just stationary like that as it came with wrinkles in it that almost made it look as if the wind was blowing. Chavez thought it was staged on a Hollywood lot and, and clung as challenged him. He clung to this conspiratorial uh, concept, um, which he's not alone about. There's a whole group of people that think the Apollo 11 was uh, forged or, in, or faked in a Hollywood back lot, uh, conspiracy theorist. I, I wanted to mention a moment because when I joked early when I started and I said, um, you know, I asked Mr. Armstrong if he ever looked up and he said no. Um, the reason I even wanted to go that way with them is most of the astronauts before Neil Armstrong and Apollo 11 came back and what they almost had a religious experience, spiritual. And what they said is here we're aimed for the moon. But what, what shocked us was the beauty of earth just floating out there, this blue, green, colorful plant looking so vulnerable and just what, you know, no borders of countries and city lines and all, it's just, floating out there. So many of the astronauts came back with a very religious feel for it. In fact, William Anders in the um, Apollo 8 in 1968 uh, famously took that photo that I'm sure all of you know, Earthrise. Uh, it's the most famous environmental um, photograph ever. It shows part of the moon and, and, and then you see Earth there. This becomes a ubiquitous photo and it makes, it's the, we're seeing our, you know, and we're, we forget we're now starting to see our, our the, the planet in color, like whole earth catalog begins. And, um, you know, many people will say the modern environmental movement begins with these photographs of earth that we thought we're dealing with the moon, but it's really earth that moves people. Well, Armstrong was selected around the time when Nixon comes in, around Nixon's inaugural in 1969. Armstrong was selected to be the commander of Apollo 11, the first lunar mission. He had uh, flown over 200 different models of aircrafts, including the X-15 rocket planes in the X-1B. Um, and the drum rolls begin. It's the big deal going all the way into that summer of, of, um, of 69, when July 16 at 9.32 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, Armstrong and astronauts Michael Collins and Edwin or Buzz Aldrin lift off from, Cape, or from Kennedy Space Center in Florida, as it was named then, it's subsequently reversed backwards, but Kennedy Space Center, and, and off they go. A um, million people just everybody crowding down in Florida to try to see this, all sorts of people, the whole world watching. There's wonderful reports to read about all of the buildup for this extraordinary moment. Most of us say, I remember it, but what we remember is watching Walter Cronkite go and tell us about it night after night after night. He had Wally Shira next to him as his anchor buddy and we're all pulling for this adventure. In a time when America was being torn apart, people thought that Nixon was lying and Johnson lied and young people didn't like old people. Um, and you know, and there's civil rights going on and all of this turmoil and then we're all in it together. We're all pulling for these three men to make it to the moon. Uh, Apollo 11 passed into its gravitational influence, the pull of the gravity of the moon on July 18th. It ended up circling the moon twice. Armstrong and Aldrin entered the lunar module, a small spacecraft named the Eagle. And this was disconnected from the larger command and service model, Columbia. Um, Cronkite was tr giving all of the detail and other, other networks too. I'm just focused on him because he was the most rated. 
Um, they were playing, Duke Ellington would write a composition about the moon and they had people from, you know, that did um, science fiction writers like Arthur C. Clarke and the like coming and talking and we had a lot of time to kill as the big moment arrived. Um, finally, uh, at 4.17 p.m., um, 4.17.40 to be exact, Eastern Daylight Time on July 20th, a major portions of the moon's population from all over tuned in to Armstrong on Armstrong's radio transmission they heard on radio or television reporting that the eagle had landed. They landed on the moon. They only had 40 seconds of fuel left. So it, it, it was a very um, touch and go situation in some ways. And there's that moment that we all remember when the door opens and Neil Armstrong famously says that's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. I asked him about that. Let's listen to the clip. Probably the question we must get tired of the most is the most famous words of the 20th century, and yeah, that's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. And I know you've answered this question so many times before, but it's you find it curious that NASA didn't script a line for you to say, that they allowed you the kind of personal freedom to, uh, to you know, I almost, if I put myself in that situation, I would have almost wanted to say, Neil, here's the line. We'd like you to say, when you get to the moment, they gave you that. Well, in retrospect, they might have wished that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, the late Julian Cheer, uh, who uh, really led the NASA relations with the outside world in, in many ways uh, was ad absolutely adamant that uh, headquarters never put words in the mouth of their their people, not just astronauts, but anybody that they let people speak for themselves. They, they made it known sort of what the party line was and uh, what the NASA position was, but beyond that, they never, uh, in my, in my, to my knowledge, uh, controlled the the, uh, the statements, public statements of others, and certainly they insisted in, in the case of the flight crews that uh, they not be told what to say, and their, that their the statements of crew be their their own uh, elocution of what they saw and what they wanted to say. And uh, as far as I know, that. That prohibition was never violated. Um, those can, words. Can we, you actually crafting we, 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 um, we can can we shut that about. for a minute? Yeah, when, and the words at that point just become, I think, the most famous words really of the 20th century. And um, they had to hurry Armstrong and Aldrin on the moon. They only had two out, two and a, and a half hours. They put out, they set up various scientific instruments on the moon. They left behind a plaque, metal plate that read, here men from planet Earth first set foot on the moon. We came in peace for all mankind. Uh, Armstrong did the best he could, scooping up rocks as quickly as possible um, in a kind of Harry Carey way, although they had been trained for geologically to pick them up. They rehook up with Collins, who had been orbiting in the Columbia spacecraft, and on Ju July 24th, the Columbia returns to Earth and Neil Armstrong is this huge national hero. Um, the reason they had to move quickly, there truly was a fear they were gonna burn up on the moon. There's something that's gonna go with their suits. There was some fear about that. Um, Armstrong later said that he had never written the words in advance. He only did them when he was there um, because he knew the chances were about 50-50. They were even gonna make it. It was probably gonna, a 50% chance it would be an aborted, um, a, an aborted mission. Um, Armstrong now goes, becomes the most sought after interview in the world. And he develops a bit of a Charles Lindbergh syndrome. If you remember, Lindbergh had the baby kidnapped and he's very worried. He's a family man, his children, and, and um, you know, it's just worried about his privacy somewhat. But um, Nixon talked to him, the president uh, on the moon. And Nixon, of course, greets them all when they come back. And Neil Armstrong decides that after, um, after it all that he you know, receives in 69, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, 
He stays in 70 and 71 working for NASA as a deputy associate administrator of aeronautics for NASA, but he felt a little bit like the old boxer Joe Lewis at the Caesars Palace Hotel as kind of a greeter. Everybody wanted to meet him. Everybody wanted his autograph. Um, his fame was stopping the job that he wanted to do, and the job he wanted to do was to be an engineer and he decided he wanted to go back into being a professor of engineering. He would have come here to Purdue to be a professor of engineering, but he was so humble, he did not have a doctorate. He had only got an MA uh, undergrad here and then an MA at University of Southern Cal, and he did not want to seem like he was bigfooting the tenured or the full professors that were real engineering professors. So he went to University of Cincinnati, where um, they had a, a more of a beginning um, aeronautical um, program, and, he t and it didn't have the intensity that it would have had being here at Purdue. He was a very good teacher. He went around the world talking about the moon when it was necessary, but in a non-commercial, non-flamboyant way, all about engineering and about science. He actually went to the Soviet Union and met with um, 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 the Soviet leaders and, and famously looked at all of their technology and, and ended up making the quip that it all was a bit Victorian compared to ours. Uh, unusual kind of comment for him. Fierce American patriot, incidentally, near Armstrong, his love of country and some of my interviews with him about China and space, uh, uh, maybe in the Q&A, um, we might want to get into a little bit, but he, uh, he, he really believed about our country um, keeping, the, keeping ahead um, in, in real ways on, on, in aeronautics. Um, and his life has all sorts of different meanings, but in the sense of wrapping down, I just wanted to tell you that he ended up um, always, as you know, loving Purdue and doing whatever he could. Um, he sued once Hallmark Cards for, for taking his quote and marketing it, and uh, he ended up giving the money from winning a lawsuit to Purdue. Um, he was honored, although he didn't want to pose next to a statue of him himself here on campus. Um, and he, of course, came, came, but would not be there at that ceremony when it happened. But he was stayed as about as active as one could hope for an alum. And of course, you guys have honored him here with the Neil Armstrong Hall of Engineering. Um, he did try to make some money after being in Cincinnati in 1979. He worked for Chrysler and did a commercial. Some people criticized it. It was a very tasteful commercial. I think the people that have criticized him for that are foolish. Um, he did serve on many corporate boards, too many to get onto and, and to name here. He also served on a couple of commissions, uh, most famously the Challenger Commission uh, when duty called upon him um, to step forward. Um, he, um, he, unfortunately, we've lost him a few years ago he, of a bad heart. He made it into his 80s. We wish we had him longer. I thought I would end um, by, you know, a, a, a just reading to you a question I asked him. Um, you know, he famously said, uh, Buzz Aldrin once famously said to Neil Armstrong, Neil, you know, we missed the whole thing. We were up there, we missed all the hoopla here on Earth. You know, we had to like catch up to find out what happened later. And I asked him, right after 9-11, I asked him, uh, Mr. Armstrong, were you disappointed after Apollo 11, after the halcyon days of the Kennedy and Johnson administrations, and now it's early Nixon years, and you've gone to the moon, that the Nixon administration, after we've went a number more times, started cutting NASA budgets? And there started to do to Vietnam and other national priorities. We started deprioritizing space. I asked him uh, as I continue my question, um, you know, what do you feel like we kind of petered out and lost interest instead of continuing on a kind of role that we had as a society? Um, what do you? And I asked him, what do we attribute it to? Why did we lose interest after we kept successfully going? His answer was, oh, I think it's predominantly the responsibility of the human character. We don't have a very long attention span and needs and pressures vary from day to day. And we have had a difficult time remembering a few months ago, or we have a difficult time looking very far into the future. We're very now oriented. I'm not surprised by, the, by this. I think we'll always be in space as Americans but it will take us longer to do the new things than the advocates would like. 
And in some cases, it will take external factors or forces which we can't control and can't anticipate that will cause things to happen or not happen. Nevertheless, looking back, we were really very privileged to live in that thin slice of history where we changed how man looks at himself and what he might become and where he might go. So I'm very thankful that we got to see it and to be a part of it. He became like those pilots that he loved and that had uh, pioneered, and I, I named you many of them, including Lindbergh and Rickenbacker, two of his favorites. He became like one of them. He did live to be part of that thin slice of history when America was moon crazy, and there was still a belief in American can-doism, that we could do something big like that and do it well, that Republicans and Democrats pitched in, that we put like $250 billion on this great effort. Um, I then asked him, do you ever hope yourself to go back into space? Is that something you'd like to do one more time after watching John Glenn go back in his 70s? And Armstrong said, if they offer me command of a Mars mission, I'd jump at it. Thank you. We're going to start with a question from Twitter. Uh, one of the uh, members in our audience asks, can you evaluate the effects Neil Armstrong had on the American youth culture? Well, it's a good it's a, yeah, it's a wonderful question because I was the American youth culture. And I've talked to a few of my new friends here at Purdue and we are all saying that we were just astronaut crazy. I used to have Major Matt Mason um, guys that were like little space figures and I collected glasses and all the Apollo missions. I mean, these were our, our heroes of the uh, 1970s, really in particular, these astronauts. And I think it brought a lot of people not just interested in space and learning more about the science, but it brought a lot of people to come to places like Purdue to want to become an astronaut. And it's not, you know, I, I, I've always cringed when I have to say men in space, the 12 men on the moon. Um, what about women? And now look how many women have become astronauts and you have the whole Sally Ride phenomena on and on and so um, I think that it's um, that what Armstrong gave us in the end and gave not just youth culture but all of us is um, he was a class act and he didn't commercialize space and that some things were sacred that science and engineering isn't about getting the accolades it's not about the ribbon cuttings and the high fives and it's not even about getting credit and that's what he was always worried about it's about doing it and doing it right that a, an engineer can't afford to mess up because lives are at stake and um and so he really was the best of uh, uh, of all things that i would call the american character and as he well knew that engineers uh, in general were probably undersung in history uh, uh, for these reasons. But what made America great in the 20th century and in the 21st century are our engineers that have done so much to make, uh, make our whole grid of America um, so functional. We're actually out of our allotted time, but we'll take audience questions if anybody wants to come up to the microphone. If not, one more Twitter question. Um, how can confidence be restored to the space programs? Um, well, it, it, money. Um, the money is short for the space program. I don't think, there, I don't, most, I have to make, I'll just say it, like 80% of Americans would love to go to Mars. I think if you ask them, but then you have to look at budgetary considerations. Where do we find the money to do it? Remember, guys, in the talk I was doing, we had the enemy. We had the dark hat, the Soviet Union. We we're going to beat them. If Kennedy and Johnson deserve great credit uh, on, the, on getting us to go to the moon and the moon race, it's that they framed it as a sporting event. So much so that when I've read the original draft of John F. Kennedy's speech, when, uh, The Greatest Adventure, when he went to Rice, and in his hand ink, it's at the Kennedy Library, he'll say, why does, um, why does Rice dare play Texas in football? Um, you know, why do we take on things that are difficult? Why would we take on Mars when it's so difficult? Because that Kennedy in the end said, you know, the answer, it's, it's human nature. We want to explore. We want to know more. That's why all of the 
country's been glued. What happened to the mystery airplane? What technology right now can we have to find it? We want an answer. Some ways, you know, you, you, people say, move on to another story, but we won't. And so there, it, it, what was great about Kennedy, he was able to press that desire and had it that we're gonna beat the Soviet Union. And both Kennedy and Johnson did a marvelous job of money dealings. I, I, I be, I'm sure Brian Lamb and um, Governor Daniels remember uh, Charlie Halleck from the state of Indiana. If you listen to Halleck on these Lyndon Johnson tapes, I mean, they're amazing because you'll have Lyndon's trying to, 50 years ago, right now, he was trying to get the Civil Rights Act pushed and was trying to get Halleck on it. And he would say Purdue. He'd say, well, I'm going to help, you know, well, you know, Purdue, I know you have about uh, meaning, you know, back me on civil rights and there'll be um, funding coming to places like <laughs> Purdue, um, you know, that to, for, for your, because you guys care a lot about the, the space program. And, and where I'm at, Rice University, um, Lyndon Johnson started trying to get, to, that land used to be, owned, the, the Manned Space Center used to be owned by Rice and political deals were made on trade-offs to get it going, but don't, don't forget, it's bipartisan going to the moon. This is not a Democrat or Republican issue. And I'm asked if Neil Armstrong's political, he tried very much not to be. I, if you ask me, and Mr. James Hansen would, wouldn't venture there because he was an authorized biography, biographer, but I would venture he was a Republican, um, um, moderate Republican, I believe very much in states' rights, uh, but, um, but would have voted not all the time. I know for a fact he voted for John Glenn, a Democrat, you know, from Ohio, or was for Glenn in the Senate and for a lot of Democrats. So he judged people by their character, but he was a, um, that's why in that last quote I read about him, he, he wasn't just, yeah, you know, he does want to go to Mars, but where's that money going to come from? And he was um, a pragmatist in, in those ways. Uh, but he would, he, if, if he could do anything, you know, it would be just promoting, he, he's, one thing he wanted to do, he never got to do, which all the astronauts thought was a little unusual. He always wanted to write a great engineering textbook. Uh, it showed that he did have an interest in writing. And even though he, I qu quizzed him enough, like he would read all of H.G. Wells and Jules Verne and a lot of these science fiction guys too. He's an exceedingly well-read man, Neil Armstrong, on a wide variety of topics. This isn't just somebody who, uh, only thought in engineer terms. Um, I mean, he was a, had a great side about the humanities, although it tended to be text about exploration, uh, war, um, you know, maybe a little bit more than, um, than novels. Two of our PICC students will now close our program. Great. First, I'd like to thank you all for attending and for participating in this forum. Uh, my name is Jonathan Goodwin, and I'm a third year student in political science with minors in economics, peace studies, and history. And I'm Anya Mansuri, and I'm a senior in political science. Dr. Brinkley, please accept this token of appreciation from PICC students for using history to give life to the work of our great Purdue hero, Neil Armstrong. Thank you all very much. Tomorrow afternoon, we have another treat for all you PICC followers. Please join Dr. Brinkley as he sits down with Brian Lamb for another edition of the popular Masterclass. Mr. Lamb interviews Dr. Brinkley on the American presidency. That's tomorrow, 1.30 p.m. in the Kerr's Auditorium in Armstrong Hall. Finally, help us to give away thousands of dollars in awards to the best PICC student communicators. Join us for the PICC Great Issues Debate on April 12th at 10 a.m. in Stewart Center, room 206. There's more information on, at our website, purdue.picc.com. PICC.purdue. Wait, hold on. <laughs> it's on the brochure. <laughs> PICC.purdue.edu. I'm sorry. Now we should invite Dr. And Mrs. Brinkley, President Daniels, Dean Jamison, and members of PICC who made this forum possible to the stage for a photo. Thank you all and good night. <laughs>